there's a story that I tell people and they say, why have you studied psychedelics for so long? And I sort of say, well, think of the things that can change your life. You fall in love, you get married, you have children, uh, maybe you get a divorce, uh, a child dies, a parent or sibling dies, you take LSD, and then I would sort of, there's a pregnant pause and people think, and I say, think about this. LSD is an extremely potent substance. You take a very tiny amount, it diffuses into your brain, it stays there for three or four hours, it diffuses back out. And for some people, they never see the world the same way again. Kelsey Grammer plays Chuck Smith. Jonathan Rumi plays Lonnie Frisbee in The Jesus Revolution. Filming has started in Cosa Mesa, California. And who exactly is Jonathan Rumi playing? Well, he's playing this man who took this hit of orange sunshine. Here's the story. Sometime in 1967, at the age of 17, Lonnie Frisbee took another trip into Taquitz Canyon. There he took a hit of LSD, removed his clothing, and began to pray in a relatively unorthodox but sincere manner. When the Lord called me, I, went, I was going into the desert and I was taking all my clothes off and I'm going, God, if you're really real, reveal yourself to me. And one afternoon, the whole atmosphere of this canyon that I was in started to tingle and get light and it started to change and I'm just going, uh-oh, I didn't want to be there. He would later recount that it was here that God came to him in a vision and told him of the unique role that he was soon to play. To by you, my beloved Jesus. It thrills my soul to see all the kids coming and following after Jesus. I kind of relate to John the Baptist down in the wilderness, baptizing in the River Jordan sometimes. It's really neat to see how each one reacts in a different way, but I can feel the presence of God coming down upon me and upon the person being baptized and just all over the place. And I, I immediately started to grow my hair a little bit longer than it was, so I, I really looked like Isaiah's grandson. <laughs> I wore St. Francis of Assisi shirts with hoods on them and wore robes and things like that. The people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> <laughs> waking state and doesn't pay much attention to altered states for example that our culture is somewhat un somewhat rare actually cross-culturally in not using psychedelics for healing and spiritual purposes actually some 90 percent of the world's cultures have access to and use altered states of consciousness and often use psychedelics for that purpose particularly for healing and for spiritual maturation insight and understanding so Jonathan Rumi has gone from playing the Christ to playing Lonnie Frisbee, who is a controversial figure, one who actually died of AIDS, one who reports he took LSD. And where exactly did he get this LSD? John Green's dream was to give LSD to everybody, change the world. Hopefully everybody could see what we were seeing. There was always this tension in the world that just seemed like it would probably go away if everybody took a dose of acid, is what we thought. That's when we decided to form a church. We 
had one of our meetings, one of our, I think it was a Wednesday night meeting, and John was trying to come up with a name for the group. Dwight Buckley said something like the Brotherhood, and somebody said, well, the Brotherhood of what? And then Chuck Mandel said, The Brotherhood of Eternal Love. The Brotherhood of Eternal Love. The Brotherhood of Eternal Love. And it stuck. The idea was that each one of those, say, 12 people would go out and have 10 or 12 people and show them how this, how this works. Everybody you know, go out and tell everybody, your workplace, your school, your family, anybody, get them to take LSD with you. The obvious thing was we need to know how to make as much acid and get it to as many people as we possibly can. We felt it was our duty to turn the world on. We really, really, truly believed that it's, it's our mission. We were called upon to do this. It felt like that to all of us. We said, this is something, this is what I have to do. Their mission was accomplished. For this documentary is tied into another documentary. Frisbee, the life and death of a hippie preacher. We will now prove their acid got into his hands, which caused a major movement of both the Vineyard and Calvary Chapel churches across the land. Where did they get the LSD? Well, we will find that it ties in to this documentary, Orange Sunshine. Here we see at the time she met Lonnie, Connie lived in a commune in Silverado Canyon, California, with a group called the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. What started as a commune with several homes in the area morphed into a major drug distribution channel for LSD and hashish. They dealt LSD for Timothy Leary, Connie recounts. They were the main people bringing hashish into Southern California from Afghanistan. Chuck is known globally as the father of the Jesus movement. And you could make a case for contemporary Christian music, which we all enjoy. We heard some of it tonight. And even contemporary praise and worship began in the early 70s at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. If that was all Chuck ever had a hand in, that would be more than enough for one guy in one lifetime. But Chuck was just getting started. Thousands of young men, now not so young, um, went out around the country and around the world and started Calvary Chapel-style churches. There are over 1,400 Calvary Chapel-style churches in the world today. So it's amazing. sort of bonded people and we found this old church in Majeska Canyon beautiful 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 little canyon we moved to Majeska Canyon as a group from our individual dwellings in Anaheim Long Beach and Garden Grove the first time I went to Majeska Canyon it felt spiritual it felt religious in a way the goal of the group at that time was your personal enlightenment, changing yourself. You know, we all started reading spiritual books and philosophies. Most of us didn't know anything. I was raised pretty much without religion. I was pretty much an atheist until I started taking psychedelics. Well, all the way in Northwest Indiana, I had taken orange sunshine 
My friend and I, John Johnson, would go up to the suburbs of Chicago and we would buy LSD and I would take it and it would put a smile on my face. I took LSD over 100 times. This is John and I up in Fraser, Colorado. My father's over on the left. He left us up there for a week and we tripped out on LSD that we had bought in Golden, Colorado and brought back to Valparaiso, Indiana, the best LSD 25 that had ever hit that town. We were heroes that summer because the town was dry. After viewing some of these documentaries, I suppose LSD does still influence some of the ways I look at things today, some of the music that I still listen to, and definitely the way that I view the world. For a fact, I had been reading the Bible and I came into a definite spiritual awareness during those couple of years I had been doing acid. I majored in art in high school and the 70s had a great influence. These pictures of the Beatles that I have drawn recently show obviously that the influence of the 70s is still a part of me and through those days of enlightenment have impacted the way I even see Christ. John and I later went down to Clearwater, Florida where I made sculptures in the sand like this one with the hippies off the pier. And during that time I started reading the Bible. I didn't take LSD and read the Bible but during that time I started becoming spiritually enlightened. I was an agnostic, I had grown up Catholic, but I came to a state of questioning and it, during this time I seemed to get some spiritual answers. Here is Clearwater, Florida during the 70s and this is the pier in which John and I smoked marijuana and did a lot of LSD with the hippies. And during that time when I got back home all of a sudden I started to realize uh, God was very real and I entered into what is called the Jesus Revolution of the 70s. The very one that was started by Lonnie Frisbee out on the west coast of California. Here in Indiana I was also being impacted and possibly as a result of some of the LSD. Here I am in college studying to be a minister. In 1965, Francis Vaughn participated in early research on psychedelics at the Foundation for Advanced Studies in Menlo Park. Well, my husband and I signed up for it really out of, I think, a sense of adventure and exploration. We had read about uh, some of the psychedelic therapy and the accounts from Al Aldous Huxley and some of the early researchers. We were both curious and we wanted to try it. It seemed that uh, we were good candidates and we passed all the, all the screening tests and so uh, um, I'm just grateful that, that that happened for us. Under carefully controlled conditions, she was given a high dose of LSD. Today, the effects of that journey are still present for her. What one is left with is the memory of the experience, and then one can talk about that, but it's impossible to convey what that experience is like in words. And it's not the same for everybody. For me, it was a deep mystical experience, and uh, it's as though the the boundaries between self and other were completely dissolved. You feel at one with everything, and uh, the self is no longer 
a separate entity. I recognize that uh, truth takes many different forms of expression, but that in some way, all the traditions are pointing at a deep underlying reality. The deepest insights sound like cliches, you know, that the truth makes you free, and that God is love, and that love is at the heart of the universe. It was as though the, the doors of perception were not only cleansed, but they disappeared altogether, and there was a noetic quality to it. Frances Vaughn wrote very eloquently about her mystical experience. As I've read that, um, you know, it meets all the criteria for a classic mystical experience. There's a sense of the interconnectedness of all things, a sense of sacredness or reverence, this noetic sense that is more real, more true than everyday waking consciousness. Uh, she also reported transcendence of time and space, heart opening, a sense of gratitude, peace, love, and then this sense of the ineffability. The, these experiences are so difficult to put into words. But Francis did such an eloquent job of describing, you know, all of those features in, in her experience. Very touching. Francis went on to become a pioneer in the field of transpersonal psychology. Her book on intuition was a breakthrough at the time of publication. She traces the inspiration for her work back to that early experience with psychedelics. Having that experience certainly influenced my work in the world because becoming aware of the extent of human suffering makes one want to uh, do whatever we can to alleviate it. So that was in part what inspired me to go back to school and study psychology and then become a psychotherapist. It's as though once you have learned to see differently, you know that there's a possibility that the way we usually see the world is very constricted and it's only a, a fraction. It is as if we were looking through the chinks of a cavern or watching the shadows in Plato's cave. And uh, that experience was like turning around and not mistaking the shadows for reality, but really uh, seeing the light for the first time. Jim Fadiman was among the researchers who conducted the study that liberated Francis and clarified the direction of her work. What was wonderful about Francis's experience is that she had had actually just the right education and had the right vocabulary. One of the things we learned is that if you, you had this experience and then you had to put it back in your little box, and if you didn't have any vocabulary, it was very difficult. And to the extent you had a vocabulary from philosophy, better from religious studies, better from mystical studies, um, and from kind of classical education, the more um, terms you had, the more kind of small boxes to put small parts in. And what was lovely in looking at Frances's is that she somehow had prepared herself, um, obviously inadvertently, perhaps, um, for this experience. And so the amount of life changing that went on was easier for Frances because she had this foundation where she had concepts that, that, that worked for her already. This documentary, was produced, this documentary was produced for the Psychoactive Substances Research Collection at the Purdue University Libraries Archive. The collection was established in 2006 with a generous gift from the Bessie Gordon Foundation. This archive seeks to document the international history of psychoactive substances and their benefits to medicine and healing and to preserve the contribution of scientists in this area of research.